All right, well, everybody welcome to, this is Pot Chain Spits and Swirls, Prestige Cooking in Viking Age Scandinavia. Um, I've taught a number of classes on kind of beginning Scandinavian cooking and Viking Age cooking. And for this culinary symposium, we're just gonna concentrate on some of the weirder implements that were used and possible uses for those and looking at the social pressures that would make feasting and those particular implements make some sense. Um, there is not a lot of research on early Scandinavian cooking. There are no cookbooks. Uh, everything that we have is archeological data and then trying to piece together small bits and whatever bits of uh, cooking ware and pottery and food fragments that are left over and putting all of that together and trying to make a cuisine out of it. And the way I've been looking at it is I go with uh, levels of, of, of plausibility. So there's, there's probable things that people probably ate. Um, plausible, which is things that it would make sense for them to do. Possible, that is things that people in that area and time could have done but there's very limited evidence that they did and probably not, which is the things that there's just absolutely no reason that they would have. Um, and it's, I try to keep everything to the two levels of, of probable and plausible. So this is high-end feasting and it's, it's more in that, that plausible because there's very little information on it. Um, the two things that I start out with is that people are highly social, and this is a touchstone that I keep going back with. And so by that, people will do whatever the rest of the group is doing, and they tend to continue to do that. The other touchstone that I go back to is that people are fundamentally lazy. And so whatever their task is that they have to do, they're going to do it in the easiest way possible to make that task be completed unless it's acted upon by an outside force, which is usually back to step one where people are very social. So we're talking about feasts. And so things are not going to be easy because we're trying to impress a bunch of people. And, and that's where we get some of the more interesting things. Um, so, when you're cooking in, in the Viking age, most of the cooking was actually done in a hearth. Um, I'm not sure how um, aware people are of how like Viking longhouses are set up. Uh, when you're having a whole bunch of people for a feast, there will be benches that go down the sides. There'll be multiple levels of the benches and people will sit on those. Down the center, there is usually a fire. That fire is for heat um, and also for light to a certain extent. Most of the cooking is actually done at a hearth, which is kind of in the back in a, in a, in a separate area. Um, we're gonna be looking at some really, really fancy cooking ware, which makes me believe that this was used not back by the hearth, but probably in the front because you're trying to impress people. There's, there's no reason to have something that's highly ornate and then hide it in the back room and not show anybody when the entire purpose of your feast is to tell people how awesome you are and how cool your food is and why your social capital should be high enough that, that they will do the things that you want them to do. Um, a lot of the feasting in, in the Viking culture, it's really politics. You're just trying to, to get that social capital together. So I'm gonna run through these slides and look at some of the implements and, and then we're gonna go back and look at every one of them. Um, so this is a, this is a spit. Um, it is much different than the continental spits that were set over a fire and then somebody slowly turned them and they were, they were, they were held up. And so they were fully supported. This one looks more like a spear. Um, you had to hold one end of it. The other end just, just sticks whatever you are cooking on it. And then you hold that over the fire. Um, it is not an implement that is made for slowly cooking something over a long period of time. Um, they're also usually ornamented in some way. And so this is probably used in front of people. 
Um, these are the swirly things. And these, there's, there's not a lot of them. They are very locally set in one space. They're, they're odd looking. Um, nobody is quite sure what they're for, but they also fall into that place of, of an implement that is very special. It looks really cool. It's going to be impressing people. It's also difficult to make. This is made out of flat stock that you then have to make into a swirl. And so you have a whole lot of iron that, that you're working. And it's, it's expensive and it's not easy to make. Um, this is another one that just shows the, the thickness. We're not sure how long they are because they're all broken off. Um, these are your more basic implements that you use. Um, frying pans are super common. Um, and this is uh, just, a, just a metal fork. And you'll notice as opposed to the spit, this metal fork has just a wooden handle. This is probably used where you're not trying to impress somebody. You're not saying, hey, I've got so much wealth that I can just put an iron handle that sticks out another four feet on my spit for no reason whatsoever. And then this is the Osberg uh, ship burial. And this has a large cauldron. The, one of the main cooking implements that you use is, is cauldrons and stone pots in Viking cooking. Um, there's also a frying pan. And in the back here, I was trying to get better pictures of this. There is a pot chain. And pot chains were used to, to hold your pot um, down from, from a beam or something up above where your fire was at. Um, this find also has this wonderful tripod that is also all iron. And this is, this is just a display of wealth that is, is ridiculous, but it was also a burial item, probably not something you used all the time. And we're gonna talk some more about that pot chain because that, that is also something that you're not going to hide in the very, very back of your, of your kitchen. That is something that is made to impress your guests. And let's go. Give me a sec. We're going to go all the way back now and talk about things individually. Oh, here we are. Okay. So when you're cooking, there's some things that you're looking at, and the the main methods of, of cooking in the Viking age were, were simmering. You put things into a pot. Um, you put things into a soapstone pot, which is really good at holding its heat. You put things in big iron pots, which is really good for cooking a whole bunch of food for a bunch of people. Um, smaller pots, not as many clay pots. There are some areas that you will use more clay pots, but overall the clay quality in the Scandinavian area is not high. And so we don't have a lot of, of clay cookware that is that was either made or has made it to now. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of sand in the clay. You can get it out, but it's clay is not a big thing that they cooked in. Um, also copper alloy pots they would they would use to a regular basis. Um, so almost everything that you cooked was in some way simmered. And and that's where you get to these spits. Um, the Malliard reaction is something that people really like. The, the flavor of, of grilled meat, that, that browning, the caramelization, that is fantastic. And you just, you don't get that if you simmer in a pot. I'm not saying that, that simmered meats and fish and that sort of thing are not good. It's just that is an entire flavor profile that this particular implement right here is perfect for. Um, I played around with this a little bit. Uh, if you want to cook a chicken with a with a spit like this, it is it is is painful. Um, it's going to take you about an hour and a half, and you you skewer the the chicken onto this and have to hold that other end, and it's not it's weighted uh, it's it's front heavy, and it is not a way that that it makes sense to use it. But if you take a, a duck or or a bird or a roast or something and you simmer it in a large pot, um, usually full of brine. That's a, another side factor that's coming in is in the Viking Age Scandinavia, there's no known salt works. So dry salt was expensive and more rare, but they're also right by the ocean. So that if you can simmer things in salt water, that's where you're getting your salt content. So either 
they used a lot of brines or they didn't eat a lot of salt and humans like salt. So I'm assuming that they probably used more brines. So if you take your bird or your meat and you simmer that in, in a pot, the salt gets into it, it will cook it all the way through and say you like your meat medium rare, you can use that pot chain earlier, pick your pot up a ways and then just have it like hanging out at 140, 150 degrees, 130, whatever you would like it to be. And then you pull it out of the pot, use this amazing spit and then cook it over that central fire in front of people. And if you're cooking it right over the fire, all you're doing is crisping up the skin, giving that that mailyard reaction. And you can then serve a whole lot of people very quickly. Um, you, can, you can crisp up a bird in about four minutes with this. So you take the cooked bird that's already hot, put it on the skewer, crisp it up. It looks fantastic. All of your guests are watching it. And also, as the meat comes off of the spit, it goes to people. And you can then set people up socially by who gets what first. Um, Viking feasts just lasted days. So you're, you're going to be eating all day, but is a very conspicuous way to say, this person got the first duck that came off the spit or the first chunk of duck or the first piece of beef that came off the spit. And it's a way to really get that social capital built um, in a flamboyant sort of way. And that's why it's this, I just, I, I love this spit. It also, it, it looks like a spear. It looks more like a weapon of war than it looks like a, a cooking implement. So then we're gonna get over to the squirrels. Um, the squirrels, and this is where things are getting very, very more towards the plausible and away from the probable. Um, this is a weird implement. They are not very big. If you can see on here, from, from here to here is 14 centimeters. Um, this is not a large thing. There was some early speculation that this is like a grill and people would cook some meat on it so that you know the fat would sizzle. And that's counterproductive in a culture in which you're trying to preserve calories. So it's probably not what it's for. Um, we don't have any that are complete unless this is complete. The, most of them are broken off at at the end, so we don't know if it had a long handle. I am kind of guessing that this had a wooden handle on the end of it. I don't know how long that was, and that would that would help figure out what it's for. But what this implement does do is it's really good for a heat transfer. So if you have that sitting by the fire and, and heating up, you can use it to heat up a drink. Um, you put it in, it steams it, you can make your ale hot like very, very quickly. And again, you're doing it in a very flamboyant way. You're, this is a feast. This is not just dinner. I'm taking this and I'm putting it in your drink and now it's hot and here you go. And that is why my meals are fancier than yours. One extra Michelin star for the Vikings. And these are just, they're, they're odd. And that's the only thing I can think that they are for is to make whatever your meal fancier. Um, they're also not very thick. This is, a, this is a great picture. It just shows how thick they are. So you're looking at three millimeters and it does, it does not hold heat, but it does heat up and then release that heat quickly. You could also use this if you were, I'm going to go back to the other one. I like that better. So if you had a, a large pot of, of like beef, um, beef is a very high social value food. It's, it's what you serve people if you're trying to really, really impress them. And if you had that sitting in your pot and your pot was like sitting at around 130 and it just hangs out, but then as you serve people, you're cutting a chunk off of your roast that's in the giant pot and then searing it with your swirly thing, that would also work. It would have that that wonderful re, um, reaction it would give your your beef a, a crust i don't know if that was what they did it is something that would work and it's something that's very delicious uh it's also something that again is very flamboyant because we're having a feast and we're trying to impress people that what we do is 
is cooler and more entertaining than everybody else. Um, I haven't figured out anything you would do with this with birds. Some of the other ideas is you might be grilling fish on it. Um, it would work pretty good with that. Fish grills very, very quickly. You're not losing any fat. Um, when you're dealing with other meats where you're trying to keep the fat, if you cook that in a large cauldron, all of your, all of your fat stays in with your broth and then you can use that for other purposes like making porridge um, or skimming it off and then saving that fat for, for other purposes. Um, but these are, I'm pretty sure are finishing tools. They, they work better for finishing a dish than they do for, um, for creating a dish. Um, we're back to our, our, our frying pans. Frying pans you may use in a feast in the main room but this is stuff that's probably going on in the back. Um, your metal fork is something that you'd be using for pulling those cooked birds or cooked chunks of meat out of the cauldron in order to then finish them with either that skewer um, or with the swirly thing. And, and it's, it's more basic kitchen tools and they're not, not fancy but they're definitely not the tools that are meant to impress people. And now we're gonna go back to this pot chain. Pot chains fascinate me because pot chains are 100% unnecessary for cooking porridge or stew or whatever in a pot over a fire. Um, a rope works just fine. The, the fire is not going up above this cauldron. The fire is underneath it. It's, it's, there's steam coming up. There's, there's no reason that you would have to have something made of iron. There is definitely no reason that you would have to have a chain made of iron with you know three different swirls coming up and a crenellation and then another hoop that has different kinds of crenellations. Um, I have one friend that's a blacksmith that, that said that this chain kind of looks like if a traveling blacksmith wanted to show people all of the things that they could do, um, every link is different. And so it's just, it's, it's incredibly ornate. It's, it's very long. And if you have something like this, it's going to be very expensive. Somebody had to spend all the time making it. It's a whole lot of iron. And this would definitely be something you would want to hang in your feast hall to show people how beautiful it was and how much you respect them because you're using this just amazing thing to hold the pot that then you're pulling that beef out of and slicing a chunk off and putting it in the skewer and searing it and then sticking it on a plate and sending it off to people. And this is going on all day. The other thing um, about pot chains though is that there are other pot chains that are not beautiful and ornate. They're just, they're just chains. They're very utilitarian. And I mean, I guess they could be used in, in in halls in which you are not being quite as fancy, but it, it makes me think that there, there's actually a reason why the iron chain was more important than using a rope. And currently my, my thinking on that is the only reason for that is if there was an excess of fat or oil in this cauldron and you did not want your longhouse to burn down if it caught on fire, as if this is held up by a rope and your fat catches on fire, the rope's gonna break, the pot's gonna fall in the fire, the fire is going to immediately be everywhere and, and, and you're not going to be impressing your guests. Not in a way that you would like to impress your guests, unless these are the kind of guests that you would like to never have again. Um, so this is the, the best argument I have that Viking Age cooking also involved fat frying. Um, pretty much every other culture also fries in fat. There's no real evidence that early Scandinavians use deep fat frying, but these cauldrons, even though they're riveted, they do not leak and, and you can deep fat fry in them just fine. And that would explain why you would need a a pot chain in the back kitchen by the hearth, as opposed to just out in front where you're trying to impress people. As it, then it becomes a safety issue. 
uh, and it makes sense. And doing the doing some deep fat frying really opens up uh, a lot of options for for how you can cook things. Um, it's it's a lot more delicious than uh, than just just simmering everything. Um, and that would make the the chain would then be be that safety issue. Uh, as far as fats went, um, Vikings had access to a lot of fat. Um, through Scandinavia, you have a lot of pigs. Earlier pigs are a lot fattier than our current pigs. You have a lot of lard. Uh, you also were really into hunting whales and seals. Farther north you go, the more seals they ended up hunting. Uh, they didn't hunt whales like, you know, large whales. They would hunt like little minky whales and you chase them into the, into the sound. And then when they beach themselves, you just stab them with the spear. It's, it's, it goes back to that rule about them being lazy that you can catch 20, 30 whales that way, as opposed to actually going out and, and having some danger. Um, I'm gonna pop in the chat too and look at look for questions. Um, is this in person too? If there's questions, can you? Uh, Vikings eating giant roast turkey legs is not probable. I would put that way down on the, um, yeah, probably not. They did eat ox, um, great ox, that's a, a seabird, and they do have large legs, so you could eat something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, like salamanders from the 18th century, um, similar, similar to that, and I, I think the swirly things would, would work like that. You can make flatbread on on the on the swirly things. Flatbread is is a low social value food, though. Flatbread is something that you would eat every day. So if you're really really trying to impress your guests and just and and make them know that they are they are so appreciated, grilling flatbread in front of them on a really cool implement is probably not going to do it. The flatbread is going to be made in the back on either the little frying pans or just on, on flat stones. Odds are really, it's probably all going to be made way ahead of time. Uh, flatbreads, they, they last quite a while. Um, with the fat strip, why not collect it later? Um, the thing with uh, Viking Age cooking, when you're, when you're running like a spit in, in later period and throughout Europe, they had fat collectors that, that went underneath it. And so as you're roasting your meat, the fat would, would, would roll down and it would go into the little collectors. Um, there is nothing like that that's ever been found. So there's not a reason why they couldn't do that. Um, there's just absolutely no evidence that they've done anything quite like that. I don't know what the pot base means. Oh, okay. Yeah, rope, it, it could wear out, but you can replace a lot of ropes. Um, the question I was reading right now is your rope wore out after years of use and the pot could fall in the fire. You can replace your rope um, very, very often uh, before you get to the point where it's going to be anywhere near the value of, of the iron. Um, Viking Age iron works were, and before that, were not really, really advanced. You're looking at a lot of bog iron, you're looking at, at smaller scale smelting. And so the iron was, was worth more. Oh, that was somebody else making it. Um, are there anyone's have anyone have any questions about any of the implements that we're doing? If you'd like, do I have a, still have a, a a class helper? Yep. You're not oh, okay. alone here. There's nothing okay. else in the chat. It, it was more commentary than question. Okay. Um, is there is there anybody that that has has used the the Viking Age skewers before? Um, sorry, spits before. 
or have you used the other ones? Yes. I've used a Viking Age spit. Okay. And uh, what, what did you use it for? Because okay. I'm, I'm trying to get more information. First of all, it's, a, like it's a bird. It was a bird. It's small yeah. enough. Um, but we tried the method that they show in um, early meal, which is to have a, um, a, a piece of wood that's a, a Y shape plunge mm -hmm. it into the ground next to the fire and put this so just beyond the um the split end you put that there and the far end um hold it under a rock and every now and then rotate it and put it back under the rock so um the bird itself is hanging close to the fire maybe not directly over the middle of it but close to it and yes it takes a long time yeah a very yeah, that's long time. I, I, I tried doing that and it wasn't it wasn't fun um, yeah. and it wasn't efficient. Mm -hmm. um, more of it's it's I do I do a lot of catering and and mm -hmm. so if you're if you're cooking for a feast, it has to also be efficient. Yeah. It, it, if it takes you an hour and a half to cook one bird, you're gonna and you're trying to feed like 150 people, they're gonna be super pissed. Um, but, so, but I love your idea about just doing it for the finish. Yeah, we did that. I, I did it with um, with ducks um, for a for a Viking um, group, and the the Osberg pot is what's like thirteen liters. It's it's huge. Um, you can easily put eight ducks into the the Osberg pot, and simmer that in in salt water so that then the salt gets in into your birds. Pull those out the most of the fat had been rendered off of the ducks, which was kind of fantastic. And then we just kind of smeared those with a little bit of, of mustard. And I think we used coriander seed and a little bit of cumin, if I remember right. And, and then just finished them off under the high heat. So it just gave you that crispy duck skin and they were fantastic. Um, and, and like I said, it was like, it was like three minutes per bird after it had been sitting in, in the pot. And the pot takes no time at all, that's super easy. So for the way that flavors come out and for the way in which it, the speed at which you can actually use the implement in order to feed people, I'm pretty sure that it's a finishing tool. Um, and I don't know, I've talked to Daniel a little bit about that, but I, yeah, I think that that was actually, that's that's using the, the, the spit wrong. Um, in the early meal where they used the spit to roast a heart over the fire, that is a much more likely reason to use this spit because you're roasting a heart and you're doing that in front of people. And that is something that is going to impress your guests um, because there's only one heart in each animal. You're doing it right in front of them more. It's more of a ceremonial dish than it is a feed the masses sort of dish. Everybody's not going to get a piece of that heart. We're going to either give the entire heart to this person that we're really trying to impress at this particular piece. That's the whole point of the thing. Or we're going to cut it up and we're going to give it to multiple people that are at the feast because we want to bring them together that they all have shared the heart of this beast that we have cooked in front of everybody. And that is a more likely way that you're mm -hmm. that you're going to use. Uh, an impressive implement like this. I have, I have never cooked heart in any way. Would you also simmer that before putting it on the no. spit? Just nope. let it That's, take. You're going to take your raw heart. You're going to. Um, they have they have a recipe in, in early meal, which is which is actually pretty pretty legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and you take out the 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 large um, arteries, and then stuff it with some herbs. Put it on the skewer and then and then roast it pretty quickly so it's it's like rare medium rare and then you slice it up so hearts a heart is not a fatty meat it's it's very very lean and so you want to you want to just kind of barely sear that and that kind of that kind of brings about the, that whole feeling of, of we're coming together and we're eating the heart of whatever this beast is that that we're sharing at this meal so that's mm -hmm. a, that's a dish that i really I really like, and it it matches the impressiveness of this this tool that we're using. And if I may ask, was it beef heart, lamb heart? What was it? Um, I believe the recipe he's using is lamb heart. 
I've I've made beef heart and lamb heart. Um, I mean, there's there's for religious reasons, there's probably more weight put to like if you did a horse heart, um, or it would be impressive if people went hunting and had brought back like a bear and you did a bear heart. That would that would be impressive, but for different reasons. Um, Vikings did not eat bears very often. That was hunting is not how you generally got your food, but that would also be impressive. Um, Hearts, they, they, they all cook very similarly because they are very, very, very lean meat. Yeah, boar heart. Um, they, had, they, had, they had a lot of pigs um, as well. Someone had a cooking hearts, separate fires along the one house main or two fires. Yeah, there would be a separate. So your, your cooking hearth is usually a, a, a square fire that is not, that is like back past the main hall. So your main hall is is where where people are doing things, and there there generally would be um, thinner hearths that run run down the middle, and that kind of gives you some heat and it gives you some light down your down your longhouse. Um, longhouses are all built slightly differently. Um, they didn't buy them at IKEA, so there's some differences. But generally, you had where people were meeting. If it, if if this was like a the the large longhouse for for a clan or a a group of people then they would have where you did meetings and feasts then you would have a hearth down the middle that was that was for light and for heat and then in the back you would have a cooking one where people are making things like porridge and and you know, flatbreads and just, just pumping out the the basically the kitchen that's pumping out all of the food that you need for the feast um, on the other end you would then have the large vat of beer and your feast would usually end when it ran out of beer. Um, like I said, these feasts are not, it's not like the feast that we do in the SCA where people sit down and you eat your feast and then you get up and you go home. Um, people would come from all around and they would slowly get there. And these feasts would go for like at least three days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. It depends on how much business had to be, be conducted. But there was always food, and there was always beer, and there's always people in this in this great house. And you would want some people doing you know something entertaining, and if you can entertain people with the cooking, that that you know kills two birds with one stone. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments on spits? Then we'll go discuss swirly things. I'm going to take that as we're done with spits. Okay, swirly things and and the, yeah. these things I just love because they're they're just odd. Um, lots of blacksmiths like to make them, so they are over well well overrepresented. Um, in both the SCA and in Viking recreation in general. Um, these are, are not common implements. There's, I believe, only one area in which they're found, probably were popular for less than 30 or 40 years, um, but they're super cool um, and they're fun to make. Making one properly is harder because they're not made with it's easy to make one if you take some some round stock and then you make a little spiral and then you pound your round stock flat, but that's not how these were made. These were made with flat stock that then you heat it up and then you made that spiral with your flat stock, spreading out the, the one layer and, and keeping the other one so that you get that, that tight spiral. And that's, that's a more difficult skill. I'm not a blacksmith. I'm impressed as hell by people that can make this. Um, but I don't think it's something that, that most people would have. This is either an advertising gimmick um, or it's something that, that's made to impress people. Um, I'd, be, I'd love to hear some other people's ideas on things that you can do with it. Because uh, like I said, it's, we have no idea what it was used for. Um, there's not residue on it because it's, it's made out of iron. It does not soak things up very well. Um, they're all rusted. But the, the uses I have found is as, as a finishing tool to just kind of like put that sear onto something um, and to just to heat up a liquid like quick. Um, and that's like 
it's a stupid human trick. Uh, Vikings used rocks to heat up liquid a lot. This is this is much fancier than a rock. Uh, I'm I'm going to say that it is very plausible that it was uncouth to um, take a hot stone and drop it into your guest drink. Um, they may have done that, but I would assume that using a, a fancy ass swirly thing would be much more impressive at, at your, you know, ninth century party. Um, I would love, does, does anyone have any ideas on what else you could do with these? Because um, this is, this is, there is so much speculation that nothing is really off the board on them. It's, they're just, they're just weird. Have they been found in a kitchen hearth? They they were found in um, in a group kitchen or, or a group cooking area, and they've also been found with other cooking implements. So they might not be used for cooking at all. Um, but they've been found near where, where other cooking stuff is. Sock dryer, they would make, actually they would make a fantastic sock dryer. Um, with flat cakes, um, the flat cakes, they, they, they could work. The, um, there is, I haven't been able to find the original source. Um, somebody had written something that they had found burnt cakes that had a swirl on them. And I cannot find any primary source for that. I can't find what dig or where those cakes are located. Um, if they were used to, to make cakes and put like a brand on them, that would, that would fall under marketing. And if you're, if you're, cakes were better than everybody else's and you had a fancy swirl on them and so people would would pay more um that would work it's just it's and i might be wrong on my valuation of, of foods but the social value of of a a barley or i guess if you made a wheat cake or something like that and put a little bit of honey in it then that would raise its its value up and then the swirl would make more sense um yeah ritual implement sort of i mean it's everything that we do that's uh socially is is kind of a ritual um not all rituals are religious we do rituals every day just because that makes us feel like we're part of our group um part of our society and so this may have been something that you did for special occasions but on special occasions do you had swirly cakes. Um, I'm not sure that's plausible. Um, a hot coaster, instead of a hot coaster, I would just heat up the drink um, because there's just not enough of them. I mean, one person could have it, but then it has a long handle and it's, they're all kind of a little bit, look like something was on the end of them. Um, this would look like a hairpin, except for from here to here is about 14 centimeters. And th this, this would have kept going. Um, it, it's it's rotted away. It, it looks like the other one. Um, this is this, this particular version. It gives us this this nice cross section that shows how thin they are. Um, the, um, this one actually doesn't have a curl. It's just more rounded. Um, it used to probably look very very similar to the other one. Um, it's just that after spending a thousand years in the dirt. Um, it's it's not kind of things. Um, it looks like it was they attempted to make it the same. It got a little bit bent in some ways, um, but the overall structure is probably the same as the first one. Um, this one is just this is this is the best preserved swirly thing um, that I'm aware of. Um, hopefully they'll do another dig and they'll find a burial and it'll have the, the swirly thing and it'll show what the handle is and it'll be right next to something else that lets us know exactly what it's for. Um, but I don't know, maybe you used it to, you know, spank your kids. We do not, <laughs> we, we don't know. It's just, it's a weird, weird thing. Um, I 
guess you could make it into a hairpin if you had a lot of hair, but this is, it's pretty heavy. So that's, that's 14 centimeters. This is, it's a little over a meter of, of iron. That's about a centimeter and a half wide, um, weighs about, I'm gonna guess about four pounds, um, which, is, which is fairly heavy if you're using it for something that's not a tool. So I'm pretty sure they're tools. Um, does anyone else have any ideas on swirly things? Uh, moving coals, you could use it to move coals. Um, especially if you're doing it in, if you're moving coals over to another area of the fire in the main fire area, in order to, to have something that was extra cool for moving the coals. So that's, that's a pretty legitimate use because it's, it looks good. The, the ashes would, would fall through. Um, the wooden handle would be fine. Um, and it's, it's way overly ornate for the use, which makes it so that it's a luxury item. Um, so that, that would be a, a legitimate use. I, I could see it just being used as the fancy way to move the coals from one place to another so that your big pot of, of meat kept at a, a perfect medium rare um, before you seared stuff off. Um, bed warmer, it might work for a bed warmer. It's the, 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 the complete thermal mass of it is, is not that great because it's, it's very thin. So in order to, to get a large temperature change, the heat of the, of the actual swirly thing would have to be very, very hot to, to implement that change. Um, when, you're, when you're working with bed warmers, you're usually looking for something with a little bit larger um, of, a, of a mass, um, some kind of a whip or stirring implement. You could use it as a stirring implement for brewing, but it would not work as well as a wooden paddle. Um, and I mean, if you're, and it doesn't transfer enough heat for brewing either. Um, for brewing, you really want to, you, you need to bring your wort up to temperature. And in order to get that much thermal mass into it, most of what they were using then for that was rocks. Um, I thought that maybe you could use it to you know, transfer your rocks, but what works really well for transferring hot rocks is a piece of cloth um, and a piece of cloth drop back down to that second rule. People are fundamentally lazy unless there is a special reason that they, they shouldn't be. And brewing beer wasn't, that was something that you did before everyone showed up. Um, yeah, it would not hold the microbes, um, but holding the microbes is, is desirable. Uh, you, I don't do as much brewing, so I am, I am, I'm cribbing off of other people that are way more wise than I, and have done a lot more, a lot more brewing, and you are going to, you're, there is, there is no way you're going to get the microbes out of your wooden tub that you're brewing your beer in, and then you can use your Usually you'd use a, a, a ring to save your, your, your yeast. And then whatever you're stirring it with is also gonna have the same yeast. And the idea that you should make multiple kinds of beer in your hall is, is, is a more modern thing. And you more want to have the kind of beer that is really good and is the kind of beer you get in your hall so that people come there so they can have that beer because that's the kind of beer that's really good. Um, for a skier stirrer, uh, my favorite skier story is when was it Eagle was um, being a kind of a dick and um, had killed some members of a farming household and run away and jumped into a vat of skier to hide and it came up to his nipples. And so the amount of skier that was being made was was huge. Um, you could use it as a skier stirrer, but again, wood is going to make a better thing. And skier is a low social value food. Um, if you're 
not trying to impress people and you're just trying to feed all of the people in your household, what you're eating is you're eating some, some grain porridge, either barley or rye, and some skier. Your porridge is probably cooked in the way that's left over from the skier, and you're throwing some fish into it. Um, honestly, barley porridge made with whey and some kind of alliums like, like leeks and herring is, is fantastic. It's, it's got all of the nutrients that you need and it keeps your people going. Um, but at a feast where you're trying to impress people, they're not gonna ever see you stirring the skier. You will probably serve them some. You're also gonna serve them some fish. Fish is lower social value, but for a lot of places, uh, it's probably like bread in, in US culture where it's, it's not really a meal unless you also ate some bread with it, um, or in some other cultures where it's not really a meal unless you ate some rice with it. Um, in early Scandinavian culture, it was more like it's not really a meal unless you had some fish. Uh, we're gonna move on to pot chains. Okay, pot chains. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions or ideas on pot chains and what their what their uses were or why you would make one incredibly fancy? Also, if anyone wants to make me this pot chain, I am I am available for it. Do you have a more close-up picture of the chain? Um, I don't. I was I was I was looking. Um, I've got a, and I can't find it. I've I've got a, a a set that that's showing all of the chain. And this this chain is like ten and a half feet long. Um, it's it's huge, and it's it's gorgeous. And I really this is the best picture that that I could pull up readily. Um, and I need to go back and and through everything I have and, and, and find a, a better picture of the pot chain. Um, is it's, it cast or wrought? Um, it, is, um, it is iron. It is, I am not an expert on Viking age metalwork. Um, it is the type of iron that they made um, the rest of their implements out of. So it's not like multiple folded. It's 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 been made into. Um, it, it appears to be made out of out of iron that has been made into a rod, and then the rod has been heated and then twisted with other parts that have been welded on. Um, if you if you can kind of look at some of the some of the joint work where the the rings are put on, and then they're they're welded onto a triple of of square and in some cases triangular iron that has then been twisted and then put onto another one and then it's held into to a held ring and i mean it's just it's a it's a lot of work and every one of the links is slightly different definitely super fancy Yeah, it's 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 one of the cooler things I, I've I've seen, and I mean, as much work and cost has gone into this as has gone into like one of the really really fancy nice swords. And how skills? A lot of your blacksmiths actually at this at this time this is this is early Iron Age, and a lot of your blacksmiths actually traveled around. Um, there were very few settlements that were large enough that you could you could actually hold onto somebody that, that, that did this um, and had enough business to keep them. So your blacksmiths would go somewhere and they'd be working for a couple of years and then they would move somewhere else, maybe work for three months, move somewhere else, stay there for the rest of the year, move somewhere else, and then work their way back around. It was, um, was kind of like one of those traveling merchant sort of things. Um, yeah, cast iron is late modern. So it's not, yeah, it's not cast. This is, this is all, they, they did all this the hard way. Um, because they would get the they would get the iron ore and then they didn't use large smelters they had smaller scale smelters so you're not smelting huge amounts of iron at once smelting ingots and then you take your ingot and then you have to pound that out into your rod 
and then you have to maybe attach more of those and then your your spirals and it's it's a lot of work um yeah this is a high status woman's grave um very high status this is this is a fantastic fantastic find um and just the fact that this cauldron comes with with an iron tripod and the pot chain so no matter where you need to be doing your feasting you're it's got you covered. Um, I really need to play with pot chain some more too, because I think they use a lot of them to, to regulate your heat. Um, you can move things up and down, makes that pretty easy. Honestly, it's easier to do that with a rope through a loop over the top of something. Um, but the chain makes it fairly easy to move your pot up and down. So I think that they were using them in that central area also so you could get your your whatever it is that's in there that's not quite ready to serve this just needs to be finished off and then you could raise that up on the pot chain to the level where it's just kind of hold temperature um think like an open bat sous vide and then pull out as people needed it and then finish it off and then serve it out and when you're trying to serve you know your 100 200 people over the course of the day with everybody having different ideas on when they wanna eat and how they'd like to eat, that would make it much easier from the person that's in charge of, of, of this feast perspective to feed something, some feed everybody something that is, is perfect every time and in a very, very flamboyant way. And I mean, that's the entire purpose of your feast. Your, your purpose of your feast is to just is to make people impressed. Um, that's your that's your social capital, and you're going to spend your wealth on something. And at this point in time, what you spent your wealth on was food, um, also on gold and silver and fancy stuff. But if you're impressing people, it was it was a lot on food. Uh, I think we have like a couple more minutes. Does anyone else have any questions or any comments or anything that they would like to add or would or would like to discuss? Um, otherwise, I think I'm going to let us all go to the next meeting. Are there any close-ups of the top of that tripod system? It's kind of hard to see how it's actually put together from this one photo. Um, there are, there are not that I have. Um, if you, this is, this is the, the Osborg, um, ship burial. And if you, if you do searches for Osborg, um, cauldron or Osborg ship burial, um, all of this, and, and eventually you can, you can dig down into the, the archival pictures of what each of these pieces want. This is a, this is a recreation of, of the, of the stand. The stand is actually not in this good a shape. It's more of the quality of that of that pot um, but there's pictures of the actual of the actual tripod and they have the, they have feet and they have the top and the top if i remember right it's just it's it's held together they're flattened and then they're and then they have holes in them and then you use a um ah, sorry um and then it's 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 held in with a with an iron rod. Does that makes sense, kind of like a rivet, but removable. Um, books that I would suggest, I, I highly recommend um, Hannah and Daniel Sarah's um, An Early Meal. That is a fantastic book. It is the currently the best book on Viking Age food out there. Um, there's some things that I don't 100% agree with. And there are some things that I do, and and that is how things should be, um, because in 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 all honesty, we we don't really know. So it's adjustable height. It is sort of adjustable height. Um, you could bring in the feet about maybe yay far before you get to the point where you can't get the cauldron in and out. So it's slightly, and and this is. 
that that tripod is is 100% uh, consumption. You are showing people that you are so awesome that you have an iron tripod and you don't need to go spend that. I made one. It literally takes four and a half minutes to cut down three little saplings, tie them together and hang a pot from it over your fire. Um, I was like, well, why wouldn't you do this? Let's see how long it does. Check me. My ax was not very sharp either. It's, it's super easy. So that tripod is a ridiculous show of wealth because it also means that you travel with this cauldron and you travel with that and that's all heavy. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. Okay, thanks.